So like the first time I went to Afghanistan, it was me and three other people that I'm responsible for. And that was just like a different scenario, being able to lead these individuals throughout that challenging environment. You know, I did well in that scenario, so they afforded me another opportunity to go back to Afghanistan. Um, but the second time I went to Afghanistan, I went by myself. And that was like something I never experienced before, like being active duty and being responsible to get to a combat zone, like literally going out to the airport in civilian clothes, hopping on a commercial flight and flying to Afghanistan. Eric Robin Jr., <laughs> Master Sergeant Robbins. That's me. How long you been in the Army? I've been in the Army 20 years, seven months, five days. Not that I'm counting. Okay. How long are you staying in the Army? Um, unfortunately, my time in the military is coming to an end. Um, I'm an IT guy at heart, and um, you ever heard of legacy equipment? Yes. I'm legacy equipment, and the Army's about to phase me out. <laughs> so it's time for me to exit. What has been your hardest leadership position? Hardest leadership position, I would say it was my time when I was in NITO. Yeah. NITO, I haven't heard of that. What is NITO, and how is it challenging? NITO is um, it's a small unit. They do real world tactical missions and NITO stands for National Intelligence Tactical Operations. Um, what made that challenging? NITO was a special place that it's a joint environment. So everyone in NITO is supposed to be there, right? So when I got selected and afforded the opportunity to work there, I showed up and I'm Staff Sergeant Robbins. And when I show up to Needle, there's a bunch of other Staff Sergeants there, right? So I'm asking myself, you know, how do I fit in? And it's one thing to lead people from when they're lesser ranked, like a, leading a subordinate. But when you got to lead your peers, it's kind of like a different environment because you got to get them to follow you, you know? And then also in NITO, it's a joint environment. So not only was I with my peers of the Army, I was with my peers from the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force. So I really got to figure out how can I be a part of this team? And me trying to figure things out, I kind of took like a, like a Coach K's mentality. And Coach K talks about this thing, he called like the fist mentality. And with the fist mentality, it's like, um, imagine you get in a fight. And if you're getting ready to fight somebody and you're trying to punch with an open hand, you know, you can damage a finger, you're going to hurt your hand, you might even break your hand. But when those fingers come together, you're going to form a fist and you can start knocking stuff out. So when I showed up the needle, I was a finger and I need to find some other fingers. And we need to form a fist and we need to get things done. So that was kind of like my mindset, you know, when I got there. And throughout my time there, I had some pretty good missions. I did two uh successful tours in afghanistan and leading people in a combat environment is a totally different scenario and it's different when you deploy like with a with big unit because you got you know your band of brothers your band of sisters and y'all coming together y'all training y'all know each other y'all go to the field y'all go down range y'all do y'all thing and then y'all come back but in needle is small teams so like the first time i went to afghanistan it was me and three other people that I'm responsible for. And that was just like a different scenario, being able to lead these individuals throughout that challenging environment. You know, I did well in that scenario, so they afforded me another opportunity to go back to Afghanistan. Um, but the second time I went to Afghanistan, I went by myself. And that was like something I never experienced before, like being active duty, and being responsible to get to a combat zone, like literally going out to the airport in civilian clothes, hopping on a commercial flight and flying to Afghanistan. So that whole arena, that whole arena in NITO, that, that's what made it challenging for me. I like the fingers and the fist reference. Hey. <laughs> um, but you're talking about leading and working with other soldiers and, and not every environment where you find uh, personnel that 
you get along with or that you like, mm -hmm. you know, both as a soldier or a service member and as a person, how, what's your outtake or look on how to lead people that you just can't stand or don't like because your values or your work ethic don't match? As a leader, you got to understand you are put in charge because people trust you and you got a mission to execute. And sometimes you got to work with the resources that you are given. Sometimes you got great resources and sometimes you don't, you know, and we are all human. And I think sometimes people lose sight of that when they're holding these leadership roles and you're going to run into people like you might genuinely don't like. Y'all might not align. Um, Y'all come from different backgrounds. I got different values. But at the end of the day, they're still part of your team. You got to take care of them and you got to get the mission done. And my kind of outlook on that is like, they're kind of like kids. Sometimes you might not like your kids, but they still your kids. You got to feed them. You got to take care of them. You got to give them something to eat. And sometimes you cook them for them. They, they don't even want to eat. They don't like what you cook, but you still feed them every time. You know, your kids grow up. They love you. They flourish. And then one day they come back to you and say, you know what? Everything you did for me, I, I really appreciate it. So even if you may not like them sometimes, take care of them kids. I like it. What is the creed of the non-commissioned officer? The creed of the non-commissioned officer, it's, it's a basic guideline that kind of gives you, to give non-commissioned officers um, a baseline how to operate, how they're supposed to be moving in the space of the non-commissioned officer. That's what the, that's what the creed is about, and that's what it stands for. What do you think of it? I like the NCO creed because it is that baseline from someone who was a junior enlisted soldier stepping into the ranks of NCO, they need something to kind of get them going down that path. And that creed helps them with that. And I do like the creed, but I believe it's like, um, it's, it's a piece of leadership. And what I mean by a piece is in the army, creeds are a thing. We got the NCO creed, you got Drill Sergeant Creed, uh, Junior Lister Soldier, they got Soldier's Creed. And all those creeds are those baselines to help govern these individuals when they're supposed to operate in those spaces, right? And why I say it's a piece of it, because let's say you just take the first part of the creed out. You know, take the Soldier Creed out, take the NCO Creed out, take the Drill Sergeant Creed out, just come with the word creed, right? I think every individual needs their own creed. Because as you step into a leadership role, Regardless what you see, regardless what you heard, you still got to be your own leader. And for you to be your own leader, you got to have your own creed. There's got to be some type of values. There's got to be some type of work ethic. There's got to be something that you've learned growing up that you believe in yourself that's part of your creed that you live by. Because a lot of times in leadership roles, you're going to be challenged a lot. And sometimes you got to look people in the face and say, you know, that's not right. And we need to go this way instead of going that way. And if you don't have your own creed to live by, I think it's kind of hard to stand up to someone when you're facing those, you know, those times of adversity. So the NCO creed, I like it. I think it serves a great purpose. And I just think it's a piece of leadership, but I also think individual creed is something that needs to be established um, to be a successful leader. So you talked about having your own creed growing up and living by your creed, but this is somebody else's or another entity's creed what made you buy into this creed or lack of a better term, drink the Kool-Aid? I believe in it. When I grew up through the military, I ran into a lot of senior leaders who took care of me and they lived by those creeds. They lived by those values. They bought into the, to the system, the structure. And I seen it firsthand. A lot of time when I first came in, I joined in right after 9-11 and the next thing you know, I'm in a combat zone. And as a junior enlisted soldier, I mean, we got basic, basic orders, be in the right place, right time, right uniform. And you got a lot of trust in these leaders. I've seen these leaders perform through those times, living through those values. So when I was afforded the opportunity to be an NCO and I was a part of that creed, it was easy for me to believe in it and live through it because I've, I've been through it. So you talked about you like the creed because the people took care of you that lived that creed previously to you. Did you ever have anybody that was senior to you that just didn't live by the creed 
and not take care of you? And how, how did that, did that make you buy more into the creed or did you second guess it from time to time because of other people that were supposed to be living by that creed, not living it? I never second guessed it because one of the things I mentioned earlier is we human. People make mistakes and people do <laughs> things that they think is right. And some people blatantly do wrong. And I kind of hate to say this, but sometimes bad leadership makes good leadership. You can be a person who has experienced or lived through bad leadership. And you look at that and say, you know, I didn't appreciate that. I didn't like that. This is how I'm going to do it better. And I'm pretty sure everyone has experienced some form of bad leadership. It has nothing to do with the military. I think no matter where you're working, you might have that one boss, that one supervisor that you feel like you could probably do a better job, you know? So part of it is being a part of the organization, believe in the organization, support the organization. Even though that individual may not be doing right, still live by your own creed, have your own values, complete the mission and just know that one day you're going to have your time to shine, and when it's your time, the things that you didn't like that didn't go well, change it. That's okay. So with the creed, um, with your creed and the NCO creed, as a senior NCO, would you say what's more important, loyalty or respect? Loyalty or respect, I would say at my level – loyalty is more important. And, and I say that loosely because I'm not saying respect isn't important, but me as a senior non-commissioned officer, professionally, I don't have an issue with people respecting me, but it's like a, a product that I've created. The way I carry myself, the way I speak, the way I talk to people, my demeanor, it kind of demands respect. So me, loyalty is kind of more important. You know, so when I walk into a room, people see Master Sergeant Robbins, right? When they see my rank, they know that there are some things that I've done that have got me to that level. And that kind of already demands some, some form of respect. And when they engage with me and I give them respect, I, I get that respect back. But that loyalty, I don't get that loyalty. I got to earn that loyalty. And me earning that loyalty from people, I got to know who you are. I got to know what you're about. You got to know who I am. You got to know what I'm about, and I got to deliver. So at my level, as a senior non-commissioned officer, I'm very much interested in gaining people's loyalty because a lot of the respect, like I said, for, for me, professionally, I, don't, I haven't had too many issues with respect. But loyalty, I think it's more important. So you said it as a senior non-commissioned officer that your current rank kind of demands the respect of the rank. Do you think it would also demands loyalty or is that kind of like what you were saying need to be earned based off the relationship back and forth? I think it could be both ways. And, you know, talking about leadership, leadership changes. If you were to ask me this years ago as Sergeant E5 Robbins, the respect would have been more important because as a new Sergeant, I, I got to earn some respect because people may see me and say, oh, you he was just a junior NCO. Now he's an NCO. Should we even respect him? So it was different. But like I said, at the senior level, as a master sergeant, respect I get a little more respect just, just because of my rank. What advice would you give someone stepping into the senior leadership role? What advice would I give them? My advice to anyone that's going to be stepping into a senior leadership role is... Um, Approach everything with genuine concern, like missions, operations, yes, but more specifically, people. Approach these people with genuine concern. You never know what someone's going through. You never know where someone's been. You have no idea what their full potential may be. And as a senior leader, your interactions with that individual, it, it can sway that either way. So you got to approach it with genuine concern. And in my opinion, one of the things that I've learned over the years is people may not remember your name. They may not remember the building, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. 
That's very important as a senior leader. How are you making people feel? For someone to say, man, that one mass art, man, he said, you know, treat me like trash, man. You know, what's his name? They, they don't remember that name, but they remember that feeling. And when you're taking care of those people, you know, you remember that one guy, mass art? Oh, I don't remember his name. Oh, man, I remember that one time my daughter was sick. He came to me and said, hey, don't worry about the mission. I got it. We're going to cover it down. Go take care of your family. That's important. So when it comes to being a senior leader, I'd say my advice to anyone would be um, approach everything with genuine concern. So I've heard you talk a lot about or reference families and kids. Um, do you feel like the Army facilitates soldiers taking care of their families? I do. And a lot of that depends on the individual who's in charge of these people at that time. And there's another analogy I'll give folks, right? The Army is like a database. And a database performs a set of functions, and it just functions, right? But a database is only as good as the information you put into it. The military is a people database. You got to take care of the people for it to function. And I think some folks lose sight of that. So that's one thing I'm always mindful of. If I can take care of someone's family or help them take care of their family, that's the most important thing to them. Helping them do that, if I need them to do whatever, go to the motor pool, take a computer over here, it's not hard for me to get that work out of them because they know I have their best interests at heart and I'm supporting their needs, their, the things they want to do and supporting their family. So I asked you what your hardest role was and that's what a lot of us remember is what the hardest times that we had to go through in the military or jobs that we have done. What's, what's the, what was the easiest, funnest role that you had regardless of rank or position? I would say one of the most rewarding roles that I've had as a leader was uh, working for generals. I worked for a lot of four-star generals. I worked for a couple two-star generals. And the reason why I say the most rewarding, kind of the most fun is because once I earn that trust with that flat officer, things were great for the people who were under me. And there are going to be a lot of people watching this and I'm going to say something, right? I don't know why, but military awards are a very touchy subject, right? I don't know why they are, they just are. But do, throughout the times I've worked for these generals, once I earned that trust, Everybody who worked for me and performed, they were well awarded. And like, for example, the last time I worked in, for a general, I was in Korea. And Korea was a one-year assignment. Everybody who worked for me throughout that time, they either left with two or three awards. I created an environment and I laid the groundwork so that when I bring their name up to that general, they know exactly who they are. Hey, this mission coming up. Hey, Jones, I need you to go with the general. Hey, we got this briefing coming up. Hey, Smith, I need you to brief the general. The, the general is kind of like motorcycle leadership. Be seen, be heard. So when that award comes across their desk and the general says, why do you deserve that? I can say, you remember Jones did this to help you facilitate your mission. And the only thing I got to do is sell the product. And it's easy to sell the facts. I'd say that's my worst, my most rewarding job. Now, we all know in being in the Army, we know the best places to go to and the worst places to go to as far as duty stations. What has been your worst and what has been your, wet, your best? Why? To be honest, there's no worse. Every time I went somewhere that I didn't want to go, something happened in my career or I made some type of connection or I made some type of friend or I might have been in the right place to help someone else out. And it's kind of one of them things, it's like, I don't know how religious people are, but sometimes I think it's just like a God thing, you know? For some reason, I was chosen to be at this place, at this time, at that moment, regardless of where I wanted to be. I mean, for example, I talked about Korea. I was in Texas, I was chilling. I bought a big old house. I was living next to my dad. I thought I was gonna retire. Army says, you gotta go to Korea. And then COVID happened. That was the last place I wanted to be, but Korea was probably one of my best assignments. It was one of my best assignments, like hands down, like it completely changed my perspective on Korea. If someone met me right now and says, hey, what do you think about going to Korea? I'd tell them, go. 
show up and show out. So I can't really say there was any bad assignments. Is there one assignment that you always tried to get or sought after because of location, job position, or you just heard that it was a great place to go? Have you heard of any, or what's the one place that got away from you throughout your career? Every place that I wanted to go and I made an effort to get there, I never went. <laughs> Everywhere I've been, the Army sent me there. Everywhere I wanted to go, the Army never sent me where I wanted to go. But there's not one that you would, you would, you 100% wanted to go, and if given right now, about to retire, they gave you that option, you would go. Well, one of my better assignments was Okinawa, Japan. It, it's time for me to retire. It's time for me to transition. But if the Army called me right now and said, we'll send you back to Okinawa for three years, I'd think about it. So there you go. Are you sure you're ready for retirement? Definitely. <laughs> legacy equipment. You keep saying legacy equipment. But you and I know, and everybody else that has served, that's what the Army operates off of. So you're taking from the Army, the operational Army, something that still could be used. There's a lot of people who have potential. And in the ranks of the non-commissioned officer, we get promoted off potential. It's time for them people to step up, fulfill their potential. The Army must evolve. Everything in life evolves or it gets phased out. I'm getting phased out. <laughs>